So we have talked about the elastic properties uh, of uh, bodies of solid materials. Uh, one thing that we haven't touched upon and are quite important um, and in fact is very important in the context of this discussion is the effects of temperature. So the temperature has been put out of the discussion so far and uh, now we are going to talk about uh, temperature effects uh, on these. Uh, on these properties that we have just discussed such as elongation, such as uh, the stresses, etcetera. And uh, think of uh, a metal such as a steel bar uh, being subjected to uh, a change in temperature. Say the temperature increases from 100 degree centigrade to 200 degree centigrade. So what is going to happen to the material and uh, what uh, effects would it have on the thermal stresses and their corresponding applications, etc. So, let us um, <coughs> talk about uh, or rather uh, make the discussion a little more quantitative by saying that uh, let us see this. Uh, so, there is a there is a rod metal rod which has an initial length L 0 and when it is subjected to a temperature difference say for example, delta T it could actually um, increase by an amount delta L. Okay. And uh, there are uh, very familiar examples such as uh, you might have seen that there are uh, small gaps in the railway tracks. Those gaps are kept to accommodate uh, the, the change in uh, length or the elongation of the, um, the rail track, the material of the rail track that it is made of. So, in this particular case, say the temperature goes from an initial T i to a final temperature T f and the length of this bar which is constrained to actually uh, increase in the direction where it is hinged. So, this is hinged um, say in a, um, against a wall uh, which we at this moment we ignore the expansion of the wall due to this uh, uh, the heat that it is subjected to. And this has caused some stress in the material and uh, it is uh, in the line of the discussion that we had that either you apply a force in order to cause an extension or you can also apply a change in temperature for the material to undergo uh, a, an elongation or if you actually lower the temperature of the body it could actually undergo a compression and uh, in any case there will be a stress that is going to be developed and this stress we will call as uh, thermal stress for uh, reasons that you would see just in a while. So, let us take this uh, temperature difference T f minus T i to be called as delta T and not only that it should be small, it is not large and in this case the, the change in length delta L is given by L 0 and you have uh, um, uh, T f minus T i and there will be a proportionality constant let us call it as alpha and just to make sure that this elongation happens due to the change in temperature we put a sub T subscript T here and this is called as a linear expansion of solids where uh, the, the material 
under the application of heat, the temperature increases from Ti to Tf and the coefficient linear coefficient of expansion is given by alpha and L0 is the initial length before the, um, the temperature difference being applied is given uh, as L0. So, this can be written as alpha L0 and delta T. So, my change in length is given by alpha L0 and delta T and um, so if we want to understand that, so what is alpha? Alpha is called as the linear coefficient of expansion, coefficient of expansion. Um, it's a uh, linear coefficient of, if you like, it's a thermal expansion. And which uh, actually appears as a proportionality constant in this equation. And um, it has, uh, uh, let's check the units and dimensions of alpha. So, alpha. So, delta L will have a, have a unit of uh, say for example, length um, and uh, alpha is something that we want to find. Uh, L0 again has the unit of uh, or the dimension of length and delta T has say the dimension of uh, uh, temperature which uh, could be in either in degree centigrade or in degree Kelvin or in Kelvin, I am so sorry, uh, in Kelvin. So, alpha uh, is 1 over temperature which we usually say in per degree centigrade, if you are talking about centigrade. <coughs> so, um, so, alpha is expressed in per degree centigrade, uh, L0 is the initial length which is known, uh, delta is the T is the temperature difference. Uh, and that causes an elongation of uh, amount delta L uh, T. Uh, now, this has to be compared with the quantities that we know and remember this delta L that we have talked about earlier under the application of tensile or compressive uh, strengths and this is given by uh, compressive stresses. Uh, so, this is given by F L 0 divided by A Y, just to remind you F is the applied force, L 0 is the, um, the initial length, A is the area of cross section of this uh, rod, uh, Y is the Young's modulus and uh, if we um, equate delta L to delta L T then we can equate the right hand sides as well and we can write alpha L0 delta T which is equal to F by A and L0 Y. Clearly L0 will cancel from both sides and we can write F over A as sigma and so this becomes equal to so, sigma can be written as um, alpha y uh, delta t and sigma is known as thermal stress. Just a few minutes back we were discussing that why it is called as a thermal stress because now this depends upon temperature, sigma which is a thermal stress depends on temperature and uh, rather it depends on the change in temperature which is a uh, temperature difference between the final and the initial values. Uh, it has to be kept in mind that uh, alpha and y both are taken to be temperature independent which is true uh, at for delta T to be uh, small that is the change in temperature is not large 
uh, if the tendon temperature becomes large, uh, then uh, we can have uh, temperature dependencies coming in Y or alpha, which uh, we do not want to discuss. Uh, that is beyond the linear regime. Uh, and this uh, will be uh, treated as um, the thermal stress, uh, which is, uh, <coughs> which is uh, now takes the place for mechanical stress, uh, which had been generated by an application of a force. And now this sigma is generated because of the application of heat and thereby changing the temperature. So, let us do an example uh, problem, uh, which uh, will make things clear for you. So, uh, we will write down the problem here. So, it is about these uh, familiar examples of uh, rail tracks uh, and the small gaps that they have in between. So, let us take this um, So, pieces of rail track each 10 meter long are laid are laid with a clearance of 5 millimeters at a temperature Thirty degrees centigrade. So the first question is: At what temperature do the do the pieces just start? touching. And the second question is, um, what is the thermal stress generated or developed if there were no if there were no clearance uh, it's given that alpha it's equal to 18 into 10 to the power minus 6 per degree centigrade and the Young's modulus of the, uh, the rail tracks that is a material forming the rail tracks is 200 into 10 to the power 6 Newton per meter square. Okay. So, uh, I hope the problem is clear that you have these pieces of rail tracks which are to be laid down in order for the trains to you know run on them, but as you know that they cannot be uh, put uh, right next to each other without having any gap, because in summer where in many places in India the temperature goes up to 45 or even near 50, the material will expand and uh, when it expands you do not want the tracks to be actually putting a lot of stress on each other, in which case they may crack. And if they crack, that could uh, cause uh, accidents, which is what uh, uh, should be avoided uh, completely. And in order to do that, they have uh, kept small gaps in between, so that even if in summer uh, they uh, expand and come closer to each other, uh, they should not cause stress. Uh, 
uh, and uh, that's how they are designed. And uh, again, in winter, where many of the places uh, go up to a temperature of say uh, four to five degrees or even lower than that, uh, the contraction should go, um, should take them apart, uh, but shouldn't take them apart uh, more than uh, the desired distance, uh, which could cause actually a, a gap in the rail tracks, uh, which is inconvenient for the <coughs> for these uh, materials. So, uh, for these uh, rails. So, let us just uh, write down all these, uh, uh, all these quantities that we have. We have L0 equal to 10 m, we have delta L uh, T which is 5 mm. Once again, I remind you that this T stands for temperature. At delta L is of course the elongation or the compression. In this case, it's the elongation, and uh, your uh, the Ti that is given is equal to 30 degree centigrade. And in the first part of the question, which says that at what temperature do these pieces start coming closer? That is, they just touch each other, which means that they fill for this five millimeter of gap that is there, uh, and so. Uh, that is uh, the first thing. And the second thing is uh, to find out what is sigma, which is asked in the second part of the question, which says, what is the thermal stress developed uh, if there were no clearance? So, had there been no clearance, uh, they would have expanded and caused um, stress, thermal stress, uh, and uh, which as I told you that which could lead eventually to breaking of the material uh, depending on the properties, the hardness and the toughness of the material that uh, we have talked about. And now, uh, let us just try to do this, I uh, am clearing our part of this uh, question. So, now all these uh, quantities that are required to calculate are given here. Uh, the linear coefficient of thermal expansion is given as 18 into 10 to the power minus 6 per degree centigrade and so is the Young's modulus that is uh, given there. So, now we have to calculate delta L t which is equal to alpha L 0 delta t. Um, so, your delta t that requires for my 5 millimeter of uh, the delta L to be covered which is equal to 5 into 10 to the power minus 3 meters. So, <coughs> delta T which is equal to delta L sub T divided by alpha L 0 and uh, if you put everything 5 into 10 to the power minus 3 uh, and uh, this is 18 into 10 to the power minus 6. Uh, multiplied by uh, 10 meters and this comes out approximately as 28 uh, degrees centigrade, which means uh, that the delta T which is equal to T f minus T i is equal to 28 degrees centigrade and which means that T f is equal to uh, 30 degree which is the initial temperature plus 28 degree um, which becomes equal to 58 degree centigrade. That means, at a temperature of 58 degree centigrade, this 5 millimeter of gaps uh, will get completely covered which means will completely close and uh, this will cause of course, a problem. So, let us see the next part of the problem which is about calculation of the thermal stress and in which case as we understand that the thermal stress uh, is computed from uh, thermal stress it is equal to uh, sigma equal to alpha y and delta t alpha being 18 into 10 to the power minus 6. Uh, y is 200 into 10 to the power 6 
and delta t is 28. So when you put together everything, uh, it comes out as 1008 Newton per meter square. So just a quick uh, understanding of this. This uh, had there been no gap kept while designing the rail track, uh, there will be a, a stress, thermal stress which is more than 1000 Newton per meter square that would develop uh, where a temperature difference of 28 degrees is induced. So this is a large stress, thermal stress that is going to be developed in the rail track. So let us uh, carry on with some more uh, problems, uh, problems on thermal stresses and the effects of temperature. So let us say uh, a bronze bar. Five meter long and a cross sectional area area of two hundred meter square is placed between two rigid walls as shown. So there are two rigid walls there is a bronze bar which has an initial length of 5 meter um, and there is a gap of uh, 20 millimeter. So, there is a gap of 20 millimeter with the right wall uh, and this happens. So, at a temperature minus 10 degree centigrade. the gap between the bar and the right wall is 20 millimeter. The question is uh, find the temperature, find the temperature at which the compressive strength, the compressive stress in the bar will be 30 into 10 cube Newton per meter square and given alpha which is the coefficient of thermal expansion expansion equal to 12 into 10 to the power minus 6 per degree centigrade and y the Young's modulus equal to 80 into 10 to the power 6 Newton per meter square. So, just to um, summarize the problem, uh, there are two rigid walls and a bronze bar 
is tied with the uh, left wall with an initial length of 5 meters. There is a small gap of 20 millimeters um, with the right wall and this is the story at minus 10 degree centigrade. The question is at what temperature there will be a compressive stress that will develop in the bar uh, of this magnitude 30 into 10 cube Newton per meter square and uh, the, the coefficient of thermal expansion and the Young's modulus are given. You have to understand one thing in this problem that uh, the compressive stress of uh, 30 into 10 cube Newton per meter square will come into the picture only when the rod will grow by 20 millimeter and will try to expand beyond that because of thermal effects and then this stress will come into picture. So, uh, at this situation there is no compressive stress because the compressive stress will come from the uh, when the, the bar will touch the right wall and will try to extend farther. So, we have to find that extension uh, because of uh, uh, because of which the, the compressive stress is developed. And uh, to find that we can uh, take a note that this must be the, uh, <coughs> the stress versus strain graph. Um, I mean we are assuming that Hooke's law is valid and we are not going beyond the elastic limit. In which case a strain of uh, delta x will be generated uh, which is strain um, <coughs> into L 0. Uh, because uh, the definition of strain is uh, delta x by L 0. So, a delta x is equal to strain into L 0 and that from the linearity relation of the stress versus strain graph. Uh, so, uh, we know that uh, y which is the Young's modulus is the stress versus strain. So, this is equal to uh, stress divided by y into L 0. So, this stress is the compressive stress that the question has talked about. So, if I put all these values 30 into 10 cube Newton per meter square divided by the Young's modulus which is 80 into 10 to the power 6 Newton per meter square into a 5 meter. This will give me a 1.875 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter. Understand that this is the extension which will happen when the rod has expanded by this 20 millimeter and because of the thermal effects it will try to uh, expand even more and there will be a compressive stress that will be developed. So, now I can put it into this formula which is equal to L equal to L 0 1 plus alpha and a T f minus T i. Uh, where T f is the final temperature which is asked for and T i is the initial temperature which is equal to minus 10 degree centigrade. So, so this uh, will be, um, so it is uh, L minus L 0 divided by L 0 is alpha and a T f plus 10 degree centigrade. Um, so, putting um, all these, so L minus L 0 is, um, so 
L is equal to 5 uh, meter plus 20 millimeter plus the delta x that we have calculated L 0 is equal to 5 meter plus 20 millimeter. Thus, L minus L 0 is simply delta x. So, delta x divided by L 0 uh, which will now have to be taken into account and we now have 1.875 into 10 to the power minus 3 uh, divided by 5. Uh, this is equal to 12 into 10 to the power minus 6 and a Tf plus 10 degrees centigrade. So, if one solves for Tf from here, it will come as 21.25 degree centigrade. So, it is at this temperature, the bar will not only will touch the right wall, but it will also start putting pressure on it because of which the compressive stress will be developed which is given by this and, um, and this uh, will happen uh, at this temperature at 21.25 degree centigrade uh, and the initial temperature was given as minus 10 degree centigrade. So, let us uh, do another problem. Uh, so, a cylindrical specimen of a certain alloy uh, having Young's modulus with a diameter three point nine millimeter experiences an elastic deformation. when a tensile load load of 2000 Newton is applied. Calculate the maximum length length of the specimen before deformation if the maximum allowable if the maximum allowable or rather maximum allowed elongation is uh, 0 0.42 mm so just to repeat uh, the entire question once again a cylindrical specimen of a certain alloy uh, which is a mixture of uh, different uh, substances uh, having an 
and Young's modulus to be 108 into 10 to the power 6 Newton per meter square with a diameter of 3.9 uh, millimeter experiences an elastic deformation. So, we are still in the elastic limit uh, when a tensile load which is a force of 2000, new, uh, 2000 Newton is applied. So, calculate the maximum length of the specimen uh, before the deformation which means that the original length is asked for if the maximum allowed elongation is 0.42 mm. So, delta L is given to be 0.42 mm. So, uh, for this cylindrical specimen your initial uh, area of cross section is equal to uh, pi and a d 0 by 2 whole square which is like a pi d 0 square over 4, uh, where d 0 is the original diameter. By original I mean that uh, before the extension and A0 is uh, the original uh, area of cross section. Uh, so, we have to calculate L0 the original length that is the length before deformation. So, L 0 is equal to delta L uh, into y uh, divided by uh, sigma, where sigma of course, is equal to f over a 0, uh, f is given to be 2000 Newton. So, if we uh, put in all these things 0 0.42 into 10 to the power minus 3. Uh, into 108 into 10 to the power 6 uh, divided by 2000 into 4 into pi and a 3.9 into 3.9 into 10 to the power minus 3 whole square. Uh, this comes out to be uh, 0.257 meter which is equal to 257 uh, sorry this is millimeter this is uh, 0.257 meter which is equal to 257 millimeter. So, that is the original length of the sample. So, let us now uh, talk about um, the energy stored in an elastic solid. See, we compress the solid under some uh, tensile force and we elongate the solid under some compressive force, etcetera. Uh, and in order to do that, the some work is done. And uh, the work that is done against this uh, elastic forces that we have discussed earlier, uh, that is there inside the material, um, for deforming it is a measure of the elastic potential energy that is stored in the sample. Okay? Um, and uh, upon again recovering back the original shape, uh, the elastic potential energy is recovered. Okay? So, uh, we let us uh, try to calculate this potential energy that is stored uh, and uh, the best example to do that is let us talk about a spring and also let us constrain ourselves to the elastic limit that means Hooke's law is valid. And where we have uh, the force to be uh, proportional to the elongation let us write it for the moment as x. So, this is the, the force that is uh, applied and this is the elongation or the compression and uh, we can write this as uh, k x and uh, we have to also put a negative sign because just to make sure that the, uh, the applied force and the uh, displacement are taking place in the opposite direction. So, this is like a restoring force. So, it restores the normal configuration of the body. Now, if we try to calculate the uh, work done. Uh, which is also the potential energy stored. So, this will be given by uh, F 
dx and at this moment let me take the magnitude of the force because we are just going to calculate the work done uh, magnitude of the work done and this is going to be k x dx uh, by between some 0 to some maximum uh, displacement or elongation x and this is half k s square. So, this is the elastic energy that is stored in the deformed body. <coughs> so, if you look at the stress strain curve, so or rather let us look at the force versus uh, the displacement curve. So, this is the linear line which uh, talks about this f equal to k x, we are ignoring the negative sign for the moment and the work done or equivalently the potential energy stored, let us write it with a u is half k s square. Similarly, if you are talking about a shearing force, suppose a cylinder, an upright cylinder of like this is given a shear and there is a deformation, angular deformation that is caused to be uh, to be say uh, theta, then um, <coughs> the force is equal to g a theta, where g is the shear modulus as we have discussed earlier, a is the area of cross section and theta is the angle of shear. So, again uh, your d x will be equal to l d theta, where l is the length of the cylinder or height of the cylinder. So, again uh, the work done or the potential energy stored is given by g a theta and l d theta which will be written as half g a l theta square. So, these are the energy uh, expressions for energy stored um, for a shear as well as uh, in a spring uh, for a linear extension of the amount s. Let us uh, look at applications of elasticity on uh, different components of human body, uh, which is uh, an interesting uh, thing to look at, because uh, even inside our body there are a lot of uh, um, uh, materials or rather lot of components which uh, um, display elastic behavior. So, let us start with the bones. Um, the bones as you know are uh, the more uh, weight bearing structures, I mean uh, they bear a lot of body weight that we have and a lot of activities that we do. Uh, you have seen those examples of a circus in which uh, a person who does stunts, uh, he can support weight of 6 people on top of him and his femur bones only get compressed by uh, 10 to the power minus 6 meters which is quite negligible. Uh, and these uh, shocks or these uh, pressures or these weights are actually supported by cartilages that are there in between the bones. So, let us talk about the femur bone. Uh, the femur bone uh, is designed to bear a lot of weight but even these bones do fracture uh, and the fracture is mainly due to applying of stress in a direction in which they are not supposed to uh, bear the stress. So, it is in a wrong direction if uh, a stress is uh, given or a stress is generated that can actually break uh, the bones. And um, so, no matter how well designed the human body is, uh, if there are um, stresses given at wrong uh, postures, uh, then uh, they will sort of break or they will rupture. Um, so, let us talk about other 
materials uh, where the strength is not all that important, but what is important is about their stretchability or their elastic properties. Uh, such materials are uh, the arteries and the veins. So, let us just list them. So, we have talked about bones. Uh, now, let us talk about arteries and veins. So, the arteries and veins are supposed to carry blood and uh, the fact that blood is carried smoothly through the arteries or the veins because the inner walls of the arteries and the veins are elastic in nature. And because they are elastic when the blood flows, they accommodate that extra pressure that is generated by the pumping of blood say uh, by the heart. And uh, similarly with the veins, the internal walls of the veins are also uh, uh, have elasticity uh, because of which the flow of blood is smooth. There are other materials where uh, there are uh, <coughs> which also has um, uh, components which have elasticity such as uh, the lungs and the tissues. Uh, they are um, <coughs> the elasticity of lungs as we know uh, plays a major part in our existence that is the lungs has to uh, pump air and that pumping efficient pumping of air uh, is crucially dependent on the elastic properties of, of the lungs. And as we age the walls of the arteries or the surface of the lungs they lose elasticity and the walls get hardened which uh, create trouble into their normal functioning as we know that uh, uh, when a person grows old all these problems are likely to occur. Um, also the other stretchable components that we have are the muscles and the skin and if one gets hurt there is a swelling and that swelling is because the skin has some elastic property and uh, over a period of time the swelling goes down and the skin comes back to its original configuration. You must have seen really old people the skin loses a lot of elasticity as people grow old. And uh, so by and large what we are trying to say is that there are the components of human body also has a lot to offer regarding the elastic properties of matter. However, the stress versus strain character that we have seen earlier in case of solid materials uh, differ a great deal with the components that we have just discussed of the human body. So, the stress versus strain curve can actually differ significantly from what we have learned and uh, each of uh, the crystalline solids or the solids that we have learned they have a generic behavior of the stress versus strain while uh, each of the physical components that we have talked about such as bones, such as about lungs, about the arteries, veins, skin etcetera they can have very different uh, stress versus strain relationship uh, as compared to each other. So, let us see a typical stress versus strain relationship of a wool fiber. Okay. The sweaters are made of wool and let us see that what kind of stress versus strain relationship they could have. So, this is the familiar graph that you have. So, this is stress and this is strain and it goes like this. 
So, this part is somewhat known to us up till this and then of course, it becomes uh, flat for quite a while that is uh, application of uh, stress uh, is not there is no uh, there is no application of stress. However, the strain keeps changing and suddenly after uh, a certain point the stress uh, becomes large without significant increase in strain and this is very different than what we have learned so far. Before we conclude this chapter uh, on the elastic properties of matter, uh, let us uh, recapitulate the things that we have learned and uh, list out some of the things that are important for our discussion. Uh, and <coughs> so, we have uh, in the context of the elastic properties, we have learnt um, Hooke's law. Uh, we have learnt about different kinds of of elastic modulus moduli uh, such as uh, we have learnt about uh, Young's modulus, bulk modulus and shear modulus. Um, stress versus strain curves in order to show that how the elastic limit is defined and uh, when do we actually talk about going beyond the elastic limit and talk about deformation. In that context, we have also discussed the difference between elastic, uh, inelastic and plastic. Uh, deformations. Uh, we have listed down a number of properties that are related to elasticity of a body such as uh, uh, properties such as <coughs> uh, toughness, brittleness, etcetera. Um, elastic properties of human body, where we not only discussed about the strength uh, of a particular component but also we have talked about uh, the stretchability of different uh, components of human body which are uh, essential for normal functioning of the body. Uh, <clears throat> so, a few important points to mention and to ponder about are the following. Before we end this list, we should also talk about a number of example problems so we have looked at uh, all these things uh, one after another in the last three classes that we have studied elastic properties of matter. So, write points to ponder. So, in order to list out a few things which you should remember and uh, which may go against the common uh, sense sometimes uh, and you should keep it in mind. One, one of them is that, uh, so a material 
having large y, y is Young's modulus, uh, it requires a large force, requires a large force to produce a small elongation or compression. In fact, the second point is quite interesting and uh, uh, it is often thought that um, the material which stretches more uh, is known to be more elastic and this is clearly a misnomer. Uh, the actual technical definition is that uh, the material which uh, stresses the material uh, which stretches or of course compresses to a lesser extent extent due to a due to a given load is termed as termed as more elastic so this a uh, second point has uh, very important consequences because it tells that a steel is more elastic than rubber because under the application of a given load uh, a steel um, stretches or compresses by definitely a smaller extent than a rubber specimen. Third which is uh, important and subtle. Uh, is that stress uh, is not a vector quantity. Um, unlike force, even though it is uh, force divided by the area, it is not uh, referred to as a uh, vector quantity. In fact, uh, because uh, to talk about uh, stresses uh, either it is uh, if it is uh, compressing then we call it as a compressive strength or if it is uh, expanding we call it as a tensile strength. All these terms are coined to show the uh, stresses being developed in materials uh, which are either uh, going outward for a tensile or going inward for a compressive stress.